Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dementia Basics Online. This is part four, understanding behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. My name is Herman Chica Alfonso, and I'm the Education Program Coordinator for the Dementia Society. Thank you for watching this video. During the previous session, called The Science of Dementia, part one, two, and three, you learn about the anatomy and the chemistry of the brain, the difference between aging brain, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia, and how you can prevent and have a healthy lifestyle. Then we move into types of dementia, and you'll learn the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, like dementia with Lewy body, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia, mixed dementia, or Parkinson's disease dementia. And finally, at the end of the section of the science of dementia, you're able to learn the challenges that we face during research in dementia and what kind of clinical trials are happening in Ottawa and how you can connect with the Bruyere Research Institute in Ottawa. Now we're moving forward into a new section, a new chapter, and it's mainly about behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, those symptoms that could definitely change the person's life and the care partner's life as well. In this phase, you'll learn that it's so important to make, to understand these symptoms and make the right assumption in order to help to support our loved one. In this video, our great speaker, Jessica Walker, will take us to different symptoms and the most common symptoms in dementia and different types of dementia. You will learn the main symptoms, and in part five, next session, you'll learn how to cope with them and how you could manage them. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you learn a lot and take those questions. Get ready for the Q&A on November 26th at 6 p.m. We're gonna have a section only on understanding behavior and psychological symptoms of dementia. So I'll see you guys there. And so when we talk about dementia, uh, what comes to mind most often is memory loss, right? So dementia is uh, characterized by cognitive changes um, that occur that really impact the person's day-to-day -day activities, right? So thinking and memory changes that lead to loss of independence. Um, and so oftentimes we think of memory loss, right? Because it's easy to see, um, we can tell when someone's repeating stories uh, or maybe they're forgetting items or missing appointments. But really under the surface, uh, there's so much more going on, right? So dementia really impacts the brain and the brain really makes up everything that we are, right? So all of who we are, uh, including our mood, our personality, our ability to make judgments and plan for the future. And so anything that the brain does can be impacted um, by dementia. Um, and so that includes our behaviors, right? And that includes our psychology as well. And so we talk about uh, psychological symptoms and behaviors because they really are complex to cope with, right? So uh, they have a high impact on the person living with dementia and on their support network, uh, on their caregivers or family members or friends. Um, and when we don't understand behavioral and psychological symptoms, it makes us more vulnerable to making the wrong assumptions, right, about why someone is acting the way they're acting. Uh, and so by learning more about behavioral and psychological symptoms that come with dementia, we can be better prepared uh, for the future if some of these uh, symptoms occur. And we can also understand or uh, normalize maybe some of the behaviors that you're seeing in your loved one currently. Um, the other reason why we want to talk about this as well is because psychological symptoms and behavioral symptoms are often uh, the reason why people end up calling us at the Dementia Society. Um, so as a care coach, I often talk with caregivers um, about strategies and approaches uh, for when someone is noticing behavioral or psychological symptoms in their loved one. Uh, it could also be a prompt for people to go and get that official diagnosis. Right? So, um, like I said, they're high impact, um, and sometimes, unfortunately, 
people are labeled as non-compliant or as a faker or oppositional. Um, and so today we're going to talk about this more because I really want to highlight how the person who's living with dementia is just doing their best. And so we have a few objectives. Um, so in the presentation today, uh, we're going to go over uh, what are behavioral and psychological symptoms. So what am I even talking about when I say that? And then why do these symptoms occur? Right? So what's happening in the brain that's causing these symptoms? And then what's the most common symptom for each type of dementia? So we'll go over some of the main types of dementia and just talk about the most frequent symptoms that tend to occur uh, in each type. So behavioral and psychological symptoms uh, really go together, right? So they um, are often happening uh, because you know, both are happening at once, right? So someone might have a behavior as a result of a psychological symptom. Um, and I've listed a few here, but I just want to point out that this is not a full list, right? So I've probably missed a few. Um, and your loved one uh, or your friend or your neighbor um, you know, if they have dementia, they're not necessarily going to experience all of these, um, and especially not all the time, right? So uh, I've just listed them here because they are symptoms that tend to come up. Um, and so I'll go over them briefly, but we're going to talk about them throughout the presentation. So uh, under the behavioral uh, symptoms, I have listed here agitation, which is really um, fidgeting, tension, low concentration, um, disinhibition, uh, which means that the person has difficulty inhibiting their emotions or their behaviors. Um, so much of the time what we're doing is we're trying to control our emotions and we're paying attention to the social context so that we know what to say and when. Uh, with this inhibition, it's a lot more difficult. The person is maybe going to say inappropriate things, they're going to act inappropriately, they might have uh, inappropriate sexual behaviors. Uh, obsessive compulsive behavior could happen. Um, so this could look like uh, lock checking or obsessing over a topic, uh, intense worry, uh, repetitive behaviors, things like that. Verbal aggression, uh, so the person might yell, um, they might uh, become uh, sort of mean, right? They could be even physically violent. Uh, and appetite disturbances. So uh, this can be because of a myriad of uh, factors. So a person's taste might actually change because of dementia, so they might not like the same things they used to, but they also could develop uh, rituals around eating that they never had before, things like that. Sleep disorders uh, happen as well, and we're going to talk about a specific uh, sleep disorder later on, um, but uh, you know, any kind of sleep disturbances, so maybe the person's internal clock is off, right, so they're staying up later uh, or they're waking up earlier, um, they're wandering during the night, um, not really sure what time it is, kind of disoriented. Uh, those things can happen. And like I said, a lot of the time it's because of some underlying psychological cause, right? Um, or something's happening, the person is experiencing um, something internally that could lead to these behaviors. Uh, so that could look like apathy, so a lack of um, mood, depression, uh, so low mood, uh, euphoria, which is elation or, or very high mood. Um, anxiety can occur, uh, irritability, hallucinations, uh, so people can really see uh, or hear things that aren't there, uh, or experience delusions. So maybe they're uh, stuck on a belief that they really think is true and does not really match reality. Uh, so these are just some examples and we'll talk a bit uh, as we go on about uh, the different ones and, and which ones occur in different types of dementias. And behavioral and psychological symptoms are very common. Um, so at some point in the journey, uh, your loved one is probably going to experience uh, some of these, one of these. Um, the most common being apathy or agitation um, or irritability can happen very often. Like I said, uh, sleep disorders uh, or changes in appetite or eating can happen in mood, right? Changes in mood. Um, but disinhibition and euphoria, they're the least frequent. Right? So they happen, but they don't happen as much uh, on average. Um, and one thing about uh, behavioral and psychological symptoms is that they tend to get worse over time. Uh, so 
in the beginning, um, there could be some of these uh, behaviors or some of these psychological symptoms, um, but as the dementia progresses, normally there's more that occur. And it reduces functionality. So this means that the person is gonna have more difficulty day to day um, because of these behavioral and psychological symptoms. So maybe uh, they'll need more help uh, engaging in tasks because they're experiencing a lot of apathy, things like that. Um, and it can lead to poor caregiver outcomes, right? And so when I say that, I mean uh, more depression in those who are caring uh, for the person with dementia, um, more burden, which means, you know, higher stress. Uh, so it can sometimes lead to earlier placement in uh, long-term care uh, homes, right? So really it's, it's uh, an important thing to talk about because of the high impact that it has on not only the person living with dementia, but on the, the people around them as well. Uh, it can lead to higher care costs. Um, so on average, a higher cost by 35%, um, meaning that the person needs you know, more help in the home, more, uh, the caregiver needs more respite, right, because of this. And so uh, it can really be a triggering event for having specialized support, uh, someone who can help um, manage these symptoms with you uh, and can even lead to that original uh, diagnosis of dementia as well. And so why do behavioral and psychological symptoms occur? Right? So what's going on in the brain that leads someone to experience uh, behaviors or symptoms that they never had before or can increase some of the behaviors and symptoms that they used to have? And I'm going to start at kind of the smallest level. Um, like Herman said, uh, there's been a few videos before this in our Dementia Basics series that went more in depth about uh, the structures in the brain, um, the parts of the brain, uh, and even about neurons and, and what they look like and what they do. Um, but this uh, might be a bit of a refresher. Uh, so I'll just go over it very quickly um, because it's important to realize that when we talk about behavioral and psychological symptoms, uh, it happens at the most basic chemical level in our brains, right? The smallest level of communication that's happening um, is what's really causing this cascade of events that, that lead to someone having uh, behaviors, right? Or experiencing emotions. And I've listed some of the main neurotransmitters in the brain. Uh, just a few of them are listed here. And neurotransmitters, what they are, are just chemical messengers, right? So it's the way that the brain communicates is how our brain cells relay messages from one cell to the other. So in the middle here, I just have a close-up of a neuron, a brain cell, uh, communicating with another neuron. Uh, and it's releasing those chemicals, those neurotransmitters uh, into a small gap between the two neurons so that it can relay a message. So uh, our neurotransmitters, uh, they're really responsible for kind of regulating our behaviors and, and our emotions. So uh, for example, serotonin uh, is a mood stabilizer, right? So uh, it also controls sleep, it controls appetite, um, it reduces depression um, and regulates anxiety. Um, and so you can imagine if there's changes at this cellular level at, uh, with the neurotransmitter serotonin, then you're going to get changes in mood, right? You're going to get eating changes, appetite changes, uh, depression, anxiety, right? So um, because there are changes happening to the brain cells, right? The brain cells are um, going through this neurodegenerate. So generation, they're kind of dying off, um, then that means there's changes in our neurotransmitter levels as well, right? And that can lead to changes in behaviors. And when there are changes in neurotransmitters and in our neurons, uh, it leads to changes in our perceptual uh, and cognitive and attentional networks as well, so our brain networks. Um, and what a brain network is, or a neural network, is essentially a bunch of cells uh, that communicate together, forming this uh, highway or relay of information, right? So it helps us uh, perceive things like taste and touch and smell, uh, vision, hearing, um, and it also helps us pay attention to the world around us, make decisions. Uh, our neural networks are responsible for, um, you know, other, other cognitions as well, like language, right? So everything I'm doing right now is relying on some uh, neural or brain networks. 
And as dementia progresses, um, it affects really the whole brain, right? So at the beginning, maybe some neural networks are affected more than others. Maybe someone's having more difficulty uh, processing language. But as the dementia progresses, it does affect the entire brain and all of our neural networks. And I do want to talk a little bit more about the perceptual networks, because uh, oftentimes these get overlooked when we talk about dementia. Um, but really our, our vision, our hearing, our uh, sense of uh, movement and touch, smell, taste, all of that can be affected by dementia. Um, and so just as an example, if you're able to, I just want you to put your hands on either side of your face, uh, blocking your peripheral vision. Um, and if you think about it, uh, if you wanted to look to the side, you'd have to turn your head completely or else you would not know what's coming from you know, your right or your left side. Uh, and that's what happens to someone with uh, dementia. So sometimes they lose that peripheral vision. Um, and so you can imagine if they're you know, sitting down, looking straight forward, and then you come uh, for, from their side, you might think they notice you coming, but they don't. Right? So you could really startle the person. And then, of course, the person might react in an unfavorable way. Uh, maybe they get really upset. Maybe they get angry. Um, and it's because the reality is smaller. Right? Their visual field is smaller. Uh, and so we need to kind of change our approach, especially in those later stages of dementia, because our vision can become more like binocular vision, right? And so if you're standing in front of the person, they can't see your face, uh, your intentions are not known, you're a stranger, right? Um, and their visual field is this small, uh, that can really impact the person, right? The, the world is much more difficult uh, to, um, to cope with because there's less visual information coming in and we really use visual information to make a lot of judgments uh, in our lives. And hearing the same thing can happen, right? So people have difficulty processing language, using the context. Um, they you know, might even have changes to their sense of touch. So certain textures don't feel the way they used to. Um, they might have difficulty with balance because they don't really know uh, what you know, where they're stepping, um, you know, the way that we shift our weight in our chair, uh, those things can be impacted by dementia. Uh, smell as well, right? So the person might not realize that maybe they need to pay attention to hygiene, right? Because they're not smelling themselves. They're not smelling when they're feeling sweaty or when it's a humid day like today. Um, and taste changes, right? So that could be just that the, the taste has literally changed. And so um, things that they used to enjoy uh, no longer tastes like they used to. Um, and it could be, you know, a preference for sweets and carbs and, and sugary treats like that as well. And so I do want to talk about uh, one area of the brain. So like I said, I'm not going to go into detail about all the different brain areas. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you can check out the other videos on the science of dementia. Um, but I am going to talk about this front part of the brain because it's very uh, important. <laughs> so it's called our brain CEO. And it's called this because it's, um, it's actually called the frontal lobes. Um, but this is a nickname because it's in charge of executive functioning, right? So um, executive functioning is kind of an umbrella term um, that really all it is is our ability to make decisions and anticipate outcomes to regulate ourselves, right? And to give a, ourselves a sense of who we are, um, it processes kind of everything else that's happening in the brain. So it's a very important area. Uh, it's involved in planning and organizing and being flexible. So our ability to change our mind happens because we have frontal lobes that allow us to do that. Um, and we can have goals, right? We can think about ourselves and we can kind of project ourselves into the future. Um, and so it really is the part of the brain that distinguishes us from other animals. Right? because we're able to have that sense of the future, the sense of uh, ourselves and how our behavior impacts other people. Um, and because it's responsible for doing so much, uh, it takes the longest to develop. Right? So our frontal lobes don't develop until uh, into our 20s. Um, and they are very vulnerable, our frontal lobes, to change, right? And so that's, that's a good thing because the ability to change our mind is usually good, right? Um, and we want to be able to adapt 
to the environment. We want to be able to um, make decisions. Uh, and so our brain is very flexible on that in that part to change. But then this makes it more vulnerable later on to change as well, right? So even though it's a good thing, it does become uh, vulnerable to dementia uh, if someone is living with dementia. And so what we say is last in, first out. So the frontal lobes is really the last to develop uh, and the first to be affected sometimes with dementia. And this has a huge impact on our behavior. So the reason why I wanted to really highlight this part of the brain is because it, it does um, it have a huge impact on why we behave the way that we do, right? Our ability to regulate our emotions and our behavior. So it's highly inter interconnected with other brain areas. Uh, like I said, takes everything else, tries to organize it, and then we create a response, right? Um, and although, you know, of course, the parts of our brain are important um, and uh, the changes that are happening at a cellular level are, are important to understanding behavioral and psychological symptoms, um, what's also important are, you know, the context that we're in what's going on around us, what are our pre-existing conditions, what type of dementia we have, right? So I've listed a whole bunch of uh, different factors that really play into why someone might exhibit behavioral and psychological symptoms, right? So the type of dementia will have an impact, the stage that the person's in, whether they're early into the diagnosis or it's quite progressed, um, the person's needs, right? If they're being met or unmet, uh, their comorbidities, which means just the underlying health conditions that they had uh, before dementia. Uh, the person's brain reserve, uh, so this is uh, called cognitive reserve, um, which really just means the, uh, the number of connections that the brain has. Uh, so things like education and life experience and genetics, uh, it can all play into how many uh, brain connections we have. Uh, and the more connections we have, um, like you saw with the neural networks, um, the more the brain's going to be able to compensate uh, when there is a diagnosis of dementia, right? The longer it takes um, for us to maybe show those behavioral and psychological symptoms. Uh, Premorbid personality. So that just means who were they, what were they like uh, before they were diagnosed with dementia? So that's going to make a difference as well. Was the person uh, much more reserved before? Were they very outgoing and sociable? Uh, those are going to change the types of needs that they have and uh, the behavioral and psychological symptoms they might have. And then their, their social network, right? So that's a, a big part of why someone might be experiencing behavioral and social, psych, sorry, psychological symptoms. Um, so who is around them supporting them through this? Uh, who is, um, you know, who understands dementia and can really kind of help them throughout this journey, right? We rely on other people. We're very social animals. Um, and so do they have caregivers or, or not? Um, and the environment overall. Uh, so when we think about the environment, you know, it's, it's really that psychosocial environment. So what, um, do they have access to healthcare? What's their home life like? Um, and, uh, you know, what kind of social programming uh, is there in the area? Things like that, right? Um, and I do want to focus on unmet needs specifically, uh, just for a second, because this is really what we talk about um, when we uh, talk about strategies, right, uh, and approaches to managing behavioral and psychological symptoms. Uh, and next week, uh, we have a guest speaker who's going to talk a little bit more in depth about management. Um, so you'll probably have a lot of questions on, okay, so, you know, how do I approach this now? Um, we're going to talk about that on July 6th, but I do want to mention this unmet needs model because uh, it's a good uh, basis to kind of start thinking about approaches and strategies. So when I talk about an unmet need, um, I'm talking about the types of things that give a person, you know, quality of life. What, what's their needs, right? Everyone has needs and everyone has different needs. Um, so, for example, um, if someone is extroverted, right, they like to have social stimulation, um, then they're going to have different social needs compared to someone who's an introvert and likes to withdraw or likes to have less social stimulation. 
right? So every person has a different, um, different types of needs and different amounts of different needs. So uh, it's not one size fits all. Um, and it really does depend as well on their physical and mental condition too, right? So if someone is highly extroverted, but then they have a type of dementia that affects language processing and that communication is gone, Right, that's going to lead to maybe them not being able to communicate with their friends and family and get that social stimulation. Right? It leads to an unmet need. Uh, the physical and psychosocial environment. Right? So right now with COVID-19, we're unable to visit people the way that we used to. Right? So there's a higher uh, incidence of social stimulation being unmet. So this all can contribute to the person not getting their needs fulfilled. And then as a result, uh, you can have different behaviors, right? Maybe behaviors that the person has never exhibited before, right? So maybe they're following around their caregiver. Maybe they're um, calling their uh, loved ones multiple times a day, right? Forgetting that they had even called, doing it over and over because they're feeling that loneliness, right? That unmet need. And so they're exhibiting these repetitive behaviors. Um, so behavior can be a way of communicating a need, right? It can let us know as friends and families and neighbors um, that the person is experiencing some underlying psychological need or emotion uh, and help us kind of, yeah, help us meet that, right? Um, and so behavior can also be a way of uh, expressing frustration. Uh, and like we talked about with the frontal lobes, uh, when that is impacted, we have a harder time inhibiting our behaviors. So just imagine when you're feeling hungry, right? That's a need when you need food. Um, and how we all get a little cranky when we need to eat. Uh, and then if we had a decreased inhibition, right? If our frontal lobes are not working the way they used to, uh, then we get a behavior, right? Maybe the person becomes very angry, agitated, anxious, uh, things like that, because they're feeling some way internally. Um, and I have the arrows going both, both ways because uh, really our response to those behaviors then impact the need, which impacts the person's psychological well-being, right? So if the person is met with uh, dismissing, um, you know, caregivers or friends and family, or, um, you know, there's a lack of understanding about how maybe they're experiencing an emotion, um, and so they're unable to meet the needs of that person in the moment, then it leads to them being potentially more isolated, right? So uh, they impact each other. Um, and so really the takeaway here is that behaviors can be a sign that there's something underlying going on. And so we need to be uh, investigators, right? We need to figure out what's going on with the person to the best we can, right? We're not gonna be perfect at it. Um, there's no kind of guidebook uh, for dementia, uh, but it just helps us kind of reframe the way uh, that we look at behavioral and psychological symptoms. So just to highlight um, kind of those those feelings that a person might have with dementia. I have a few quotes here um, that are, they're actually from people who are, are living with dementia, but in their early stages. Um, so they have a bit more insight and so they're able to communicate really how it feels. So I'll just read a couple. Um, so this feeling I can liken to a necklace being all tangled up and having to sit there and untangle the knots. So panic arises inside you and you find it impossible to work out what day it is and what you're supposed to do. So on these occasions, I can feel like your head wants to explode and you're just out of control. Um, so I don't know if anyone has ever tried to untangle uh, knots in a necklace, um, but yeah, it's frustrating, right? It results sometimes in people giving up. Uh, and so the person might look like they're giving up right? It might look like they're, um, they're not trying, but in reality, they're trying very, very hard. Imagine yourself in a strange building, uh, one that you've never seen, surrounded with items that you've never seen, and then one by one, people, complete strangers, begin to enter the room and talk to you as if they've known you uh, their entire life, or your entire life. Uh, this simple scenario does not even begin to show what a dementia patient goes through. So if that's my reality, 
if that's how I'm experiencing the world because of those changes, because of the changes that are happening even at the most basic cellular level, um, that's how I'm experiencing the world, I might have behavioral symptoms that I never had before, or I might be more quick to temper or more anxious or more upset um, about things than um, you know, seems normal for the person. Um, and so in social psychology, uh, we talk about really two ways to look at a situation. Um, so I'm just gonna go over this uh, with an example that uh, a lot of people will maybe uh, understand and associate with, and it's while you're driving. Right? So um, all the time uh, people experience uh, things in traffic that you know, really perk us. And um, so in this scenario, someone cuts you off in traffic. Right? So they've cut you off and you essentially have a choice. Right? So you can explain uh, the behavior, the, the person cutting you off as situational. Um, so you can maybe think about scenarios where the person is a caregiver. Right? They've had an exhausting long day. Um, maybe they're uh, ill themselves, right? And so when we think about these things, we start to be a little bit more tolerant. We might give the person, um, you know, more room on the road. Whereas in the second scenario, when we talk about um, dispositional attribution, that's when you explain someone's behavior as purposeful and intentional, right? So the person cut me off on purpose to inconvenience me, um, they're crazy, they're not, you know, they're not thinking on purpose. Um, and so that might lead us to have reactions um, like speeding up or call it, you know, yelling at them, whatever it is that we do when we're feeling uh, offended and frustrated. Um, and so the same is true when we're talking about the behaviors of people living with dementia, right? Our loved ones, our family members, our friends, uh, their behaviors can either be explained as, you know, them living with a condition that they don't have control over, um, or as doing it purposefully, right? As trying to be um, oppositional, right? So we do have a choice in the way that we frame uh, the other person's behaviors. And this is where I really wanna just talk about a concept called anosognosia. Uh, and if you've never heard this term before, what it means is lack of knowledge or no knowledge, no insight, and um, everyone living with dementia at some point uh, starts to forget or be unaware that they have dementia, right? So in the beginning stages and the early stages, uh, people might have a little bit more insight. They might know that something's off, uh, especially in those early um, onset uh, dementias, the young onset dementias. But as the dementia progresses, people become less and less aware of their challenges. And this is really the paradox of dementia, is that the person forgets that they're forgetting, they're unaware that they're unaware, um, and explaining it to them or telling them is not gonna work, right? Because the brain is not in a position where it can take that information and actually process it, right? So you could tell them many times that they have memory loss, it's not going to work, right? Um, and it's not the person denying it, they're not lying, they're not, um, pretending that their problems don't exist or their challenges don't exist. Uh, they're not pretending that they do uh, have good memory or anything like that. They really just don't know sometimes that they have this diagnosis. And so you can imagine um, if you are a primary caregiver and you know, you're in your, that person's space, right? You're trying to help them, you're trying to do things for them and they don't know that they're having challenges um, well, in that scenario, you know, if I'm the person with dementia, who do I think the problem is, right? Um, so I might act in ways that I would act if someone's in my personal bubble or trying to help me with something when I'm, you know, totally independent. I have no idea that I need you or depend on you, right? Um, and so just understanding that the person doesn't have uh, knowledge or insight into their diagnosis can help us be a little bit more patient. All right, so I'm going to talk about the behavioral and psychological symptoms that are most likely to occur uh, in each type of dementia. Um, and I just want to highlight that 
like we talked about earlier, um, you know, a person being made up of so much more than just the type of dementia, it means that there's no one size fits all. Right. So I'm going to talk about uh, different behaviors that happen with different types, but it doesn't mean that if your loved one does have, let's say, Alzheimer's disease, that they're 100 percent going to exhibit these behaviors or these psychological symptoms. Right. It's there is no one size fits all. Everyone is different. Um, but I'm just going to give you some of the most frequently reported uh, on average behaviors that, that people have. Um, and I have a nice little umbrella here um, showing that dementia is an umbrella term, right? So it's really just a way of describing uh, many different types of diseases that contribute to cognitive changes that lead to a person uh, having less independence. Um, and so I'll start with Alzheimer's disease. I'm not going to cover all of the dementias listed here. I'm going to cover uh, four of them. Um, when we talk about Lewy body dementia, a lot of the behavioral and psychological symptoms there uh, will also apply to Parkinson's disease dementia as well. Um, and mixed dementia just means that the person has more than one type. Uh, so they might have Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, for instance. Um, so going forward, I'm just going to talk about Alzheimer's, frontal temporal dementia, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, and vascular dementia. So with Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common type of dementia, uh, the most common symptom is apathy. And that just means that the person is without emotion. That's where that word comes from. So it's different than dementia, or sorry, it's different than depression because depression is really this marked sadness, right? a prolonged uh, low mood. Whereas apathy is really the lack of mood. So they might show a, lo a loss of motivation um, or a loss of interest uh, because they have this blunted emotion, right? So they're not getting as much joy out of some of their daily activities or hobbies that they used to get out of those hobbies, right? Um, and they just lose some interest, right? So our, our moods, our emotions really help us decide what to do in a day. They motivate us to do things. And so if you're experiencing apathy, you might have less motivation. And this is a, a very dominant symptom. So um, it's, uh, it occurs in 40% of people with uh, you know, mild Alzheimer's disease um, and over 90% as the disease progresses. Right? So apathy, um, it's very common. Uh, and it can be very frustrating for the care partner or caregiver, right? Because the person just doesn't seem to care. Right? They don't necessarily care that they're having a challenge or that uh, they're not engaging with friends or family anymore. It's just that that emotion is blunted uh, and it's, it's not their fault. Right? It's just the way they're experiencing the world. Um, I want to talk about depression as well uh, because it's so, so closely linked uh, with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in fact, it, it's actually sometimes really hard to differentiate uh, between depression and Alzheimer's dementia. Um, and so in the middle here of the two circles, I've listed uh, some of the uh, same psychological and behavioral symptoms uh, that occur in each of them, right? So in both depression and in Alzheimer's dementia, you can see sleep disturbances, changes in appetite, um, apathy, uh, psychomotor retardation, which means there's uh, a change in uh, how fast people are thinking and acting, right? So there's slower motor behaviors or slower thinking styles. Um, irritability can happen in both depression and in Alzheimer's dementia, uh, but they are very different. So it is important to still get this differential diagnosis. Right? because the treatment options are different. So depression will respond most li more likely to antidepressant medication, whereas dementia won't. Right? So um, there's a clear difference here in the treatment options um, and in the way that uh, we approach it as well. Right? So uh, I've listed some differences between uh, depression and dementia too. Um, so with depression, you'd see more persistent sadness and it tends to be worse in the morning. Um, and accompanied by guilt or suicidal thoughts or acts, right? And that doesn't happen in dementia. Um, so when a person has dementia, they might have things like language difficulties 
or uh, motor difficulties, apraxia, um, or disorientation. I don't know what day or time it is, um, but that doesn't happen in depression, right? So they are two different things, but they're very, very overlapping and they actually co-occur. Um, so de uh, depression is a very common symptom of uh, Alzheimer's dementia. Right, so it does become very confusing because they can happen at the exact same time. Um, and in most uh, cases, the patient is not reacting to the diagnosis, right? So again, we talked about the concept of anosognosia, where the person doesn't necessarily know that they have dementia, but they're still perhaps exhibiting depression, right? So they're feeling sad, um, they're, they're feeling uh, very low, and it's not necessarily because they know about the diagnosis, although of course that can happen. A person can become depressed if they know, um, but it doesn't mean that they know, right? It's not a sign that the person has accepted that they have dementia, that's not true. Um, so it's perplexing in that way. Um, the person is experiencing depression really because of those uh, neurotransmitters that we talked about towards the beginning, right? There's changes in the levels of those molecules, uh, which, changes the way that we experience our, our reality and the moods that we have day to day. Um, so some risk factors of depression uh, are being female. Um, females have depression just more often on average, right? So it doesn't mean that men won't get depression, it's just averages. Uh, previous history of depression um, can be important uh, because it makes you more likely to experience depression if you were to develop a dementia. Um, and depression is more common in younger onset. Um, the outcomes are that it reduces day-to-day -day functioning, right? So the person has more difficulty being motivated and in initiating tasks, and um, they're, they're just um, maybe relying more on their uh, social network because they're just, they're not feeling like engaging. Um, and so you might find that the person is, is harder to prompt um, and things like that. Um, and it can increase problematic behaviors too, right? So not only might they, might they experience some apathy, but they could experience agitation, right? Or aggression uh, because of depression. Uh, this increases long-term care placement, um, the, the um, rate in which um, the person goes into long-term care. So maybe it would happen earlier than if they didn't have depression. Um, not all the time, but it's just risk factors, right? Uh, and this is because it does increase the stress on the caregiver. Anxiety too is a big one. Um, so anxiety occurs in more than 50% of people who are living with Alzheimer's dementia uh, and anxiety affects cognition. So if you're experiencing high anxiety, you might have more difficulty with memory. Right, more memory challenges, more thinking challenges, you might not think straight. Uh, so it can really kind of worsen the effects of the dementia if someone's having anxiety. Um, and it can lead to agitation. So you might notice that the person is doing more purposeless uh, motor activity. They have that inner tension. Um, sometimes they can become aggressive because of the anxiety. So again, those underlying psychological symptoms, they're really highly linked to those behaviors that we see. And they can happen more often in the evening hours, right? So as the sun goes down, people are more likely to experience behavioral and psychological symptoms. Um, there are many different reasons for this. Um, so one factor is just that our brain gets more tired in the evening time, right? So you might notice when you're feeling drowsy, you're feeling exhausted, you're feeling tired, you have less inhibition, right? So we become cranky. We might do behaviors that we wouldn't have done if we had a well-rested day. Um, so just like anyone else, someone who's living with dementia um, can exhibit more behaviors when they become tired, right? It's just that that front part of the brain is not working to regulate them, right? To, to help us kind of control those emotions that come with feeling tired. Um, low light can do it as well because, like we mentioned earlier, uh, vision changes, right? So the person might be um, having challenges interpreting shadows, right? And so if you have more shadows in the room, you're more likely to get some anxiety because it's harder for the brain to interpret those shadows. Um, 
Cortisol levels, uh, so that's our stress hormone. Um, they peak in the evening hours, so that can lead to more behaviors and symptoms. And just the internal clock disruption, right? So I've talked about sleep disturbances uh, at the beginning, how that can be a symptom, and they're a symptom of in a lot of dementias. Uh, and that internal clock disruption can just lead to the person feeling more disoriented and more confused, right? And especially in the evening time, um, in about 20 to 45 percent of people. Um, so I'll talk about vascular dementia um, next. So that's less common than Alzheimer's. Um, and it's a lot more difficult to predict or um, outline the behaviors with vascular dementia only because it really, really depends on where a cardiovascular event happened. So if it's a stroke, for instance, um, and how bad uh, the stroke was, for example, right? So um, it, that really kind of dictates what's gonna happen. So if the person has uh, a stroke on the left side of their brain, their left hemisphere, they're more likely to uh, have language impairment. Um, and so that's, you know, the more so than someone who had uh, maybe a stroke on the right side or the right hemisphere, right? So it depends on the location um, and the severity. Uh, so again, it's not a one-size-fits-all, but I'll just talk about a few of the behavior and psychological symptoms um, that do occur uh, most often with vascular dementia. Um, and those are the changes in mood, okay? So um, people often can have uh, what's called emotional liability, where they have very sudden and intense displays of emotion, right? So that emotion might not actually match the way that they're feeling internally but they just really have a hard time regulating the intensity of the emotion that they're expressing. And so um, someone might be reacting in a way that's just inappropriate for the social context, right? So they might laugh uh, when really the social context does not call for laughter, right? Or they might cry or become very upset at something that seemed very minor. Um, and it's very fluctuating. Right? So it's not that the person is feeling these intense emotions all the time, uh, it's that they can occur uh, very suddenly and they can stop just as suddenly as they started. Um, another change uh, can be uh, those sleep disturbances. Right? So uh, someone might be uh, having just a total change in their internal clock um, just because of the underlying vascular event. Right? So uh, vascular dementia can happen because of a stroke, um, but it can also happen because of cardiovascular disease and other types of diseases that um, make changes to our circulation. And in the previous Science of Dementia videos, we talk a lot about, uh, or the doctors talked a lot about um, how important circulation is, right? Our brain is taking up so much uh, of our uh, nutrients in our blood. And so having a good circulation is uh, what helps us be alert and have high cognitive functioning. Uh, and so when there are changes to that, it can cause uh, vascular issues. And when there are very intense vascular uh, problems that, that occur, it can lead to vascular dementia. Lewy body dementia is a lot less common, um, but it's a very important one to talk about uh, when we're talking about behavioral and psychological symptoms, um, because in Lewy body dementia, uh, there are quite a few. Um, so I'll spend a bit of time here, I'm really talking about some uh, behavior and psychological symptoms. Um, they're a bit different than the other dementias that we just covered, but in a lot of ways, they're also very similar. Right, so the first three points are very similar to Alzheimer's disease, right? So anxiety, depression, apathy, agitation and sleep disorders. Um, but psychosis happens in about 50% of Lewy body uh, dementia cases. Um, and so psychosis, uh, what I mean is hallucinations and delusions. And I'll go a bit more into detail about what I mean uh, by hallucinations and delusions. Um, and with Lewy body dementia, really a core criteria is that there are moment-to-moment -moment fluctuations in the person's cognition, right? So the person can have 
very clear moments or days um, and then that can change to uh, being very marked um, challenges right so the person has days where they're really just not themselves they're having lots of cognitive difficulties problems with thinking and memory and so on um, and so these marked fluctuations can make it very challenging because one day the person might seem like they're you know fairly back to normal um, but in the next day they might exhibit some challenges and, and people often get labeled as fakers, right? Trying to get out of uh, social situations that uh, they don't wanna be in and, and things like that. That's really not what's happening. Um, it's just the way that our brain goes through these cycles. And unlike other types of dementia, um, these marked kind of moment to moment fluctuations are not a result of sundowning. Um, or of um, some external uh, factor all the time, right, sometimes, but for the most part, it's really internally driven. Um, so there's changes in neurotransmitters, uh, and that's what's causing the fluctuations, right? So um, it's different for every person, but those are kind of the main criteria that, uh, that goes into diagnosing Lewy body dementia. One thing that can happen with Lewy body, uh, and it happens in, in a lot of cases, um, I believe it's over 60%, um, is REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, and this can be one of the earliest signs of Lewy body dementia. Um, and what it is, is people act out their dreams. So it's a bit different than sleepwalking, because sleepwalking happens in non-REM sleep, so when you're not dreaming. Um, this happens when the person is dreaming. So they really do think, um, you know, in the moment when they're punching in their sleep, uh, that they're kickboxing, right, like in this picture. Um, and so that can result in a lot of, uh, you know, traumatic events at night, right? The person can fall out of bed, they can injure themselves or their sleep partner. Um, and they're often very confused when they wake up and they won't necessarily remember that the event happened. Um, so this can be a, a good sign that something is happening in the brain. Uh, if a person is acting out their dream. Um, and it's most likely to happen with, with Lewy body dementia. Hallucinations and delusions. Um, so a hallucination is seeing or hearing or feeling something that isn't there. With dementia, it's most likely to be visual. Um, so the person is seeing other people or animals often in motion. Uh, and they're very vivid images, right? So it's not that someone thinks they might have seen something, um, but they're, they're physically seeing what they're talking about, right? So if they're talking about uh, an animal in the living room, they are most likely seeing that animal in the living room. Um, they can be more frequent in the evening. Again, that's because of things like shadows um, and when the visual system is impacted, right? Not necessarily the eyes, but the brain, right? The way that the brain is taking in information is changing. Uh, and so the person's brain is just trying to make sense of what's going on, right? Um, and sometimes that can result in a visual image. Uh, and it's not necessarily disturbing for the person. Um, so in the next uh, presentation on July 6th, our guest speaker is going to talk a little bit about um, managing behavioral and psychological symptoms. And um, a lot of the time it's based on, you know, is this disturbing, right? Is it causing harm? Is the person upset? And if the answer is no, then it's really a harmless situation, right? If they see an animal in the living room, um, that's all right. And, and often if we, um, if we argue with it, if we explain it away, uh, it's dismissing the person's reality, right? Because that's really what they're seeing, right? So we can ask them questions about what they're seeing, or we can redirect the conversation. We can go somewhere else. Maybe there's something in that room that was causing it, right? So um, they're not always disturbing, but if they are, then we might want to definitely redirect the person in that moment. Um, and the same is true with delusions, right? So um, delusions are false beliefs that are very firmly held, um, despite there not re really being ev any evidence. So someone might be paranoid. They might think that uh, someone is stealing uh, from them or spying on them. Um, they might feel jealous, 
uh, think their partner is cheating. They might think that a partner has been replaced with someone else or a family member has been replaced. Um, and just like hallucinations, these are real experiences, right? This is the real reality for that person in that moment because of the brain changes that are happening. Um, and so it's not going to be able to um, be explained away. Right? We're not going to be able to reason with the person necessarily. If we do try and convince them that it's not happening, um, a lot of the time you might get more behavioral symptoms. Right, The person then becomes upset with you or angry at you for not believing them. They might not trust you. Right, And so when we talk about delusions, um, we're talking about really, really firmly held beliefs that they're not going to budge. Right, So again, there's an underlying feeling that's accompanied by these behavioral and psychological symptoms, right? So a person who is feeling, um, you know, paranoia, that's a really scary situation, right? If you believe someone is stealing from you, it's, it's not fun. It's not, it's not a nice thing to feel. Um, and so the best way to interact in that situation is to acknowledge how scary that really is. Right? Just as if anyone, a best friend, uh, another family member, um, you would try to comfort them and, and reassure them. The same is true for someone living with dementia. Even if you know that that situation maybe didn't occur, maybe they misplaced the item because of memory uh, challenges, um, it's still their reality. It's still what's happening. Right. The last one I'm going to talk about is frontal temporal dementia. Uh, again, it's less common. Um, but it's an important one to talk about because it's kind of in the name, right? So frontal temporal. We talked about the front part of the brain, the frontal lobes. Um, that's more likely to be affected in frontal temporal dementia. And so, of course, it leads to lots of behavioral and psychological symptoms because that's a part of the brain that's responsible for a whole lot of uh, what we do, um, how we handle situations, how we act in the world, how we decide to respond uh, to other people, that's all in the frontal lobes. Um, and so with frontal temporal dementia, you might see more impulsivity. Um, so that could look like the person uh, saying inappropriate things, or maybe they're having a hard time controlling things like spending, right? They might shop a lot, gamble a lot. Um, they could uh, act impulsively, um, you know, the, exhibit hypersexual activity, um, urinate in public, those types of things, right? That can happen if we have changes to the frontal lobes. They might have appetite uh, changes as well. Um, so we talked about that a little bit, but it could look like overeating um, or eating only sweets and carbs or wanting only sweets and carbs. Um, it can look like attempting to eat in, uh, inedible objects. So the person might try and eat something that you're really not supposed to eat. Um, obsessive compulsive behavior. So that could be checking locks and doors over and over again, or hoarding items, um, counting, even going to the washroom uh, multiple times can be a sign of obsessive compulsive behavior. Repetitive moments, uh, movements, sorry. Uh, so that's like clapping and tapping, uh, throat clearing, humming. Um, it can look like a tick that the person has developed. Uh, changes in hygiene. So this is a big one. Um, they can completely neglect hygiene sometimes with frontal temporal dementia um, and maybe even develop rituals surrounding dressing or bathing, things like that. Uh, so lots of really marked uh, changes in the way that the person behaves. Um, so a lot of the time it almost seems like the person has kind of changed personalities altogether. So I just want to put it all together, um, mostly because so much of the behavioral and psychological symptoms that I talked about, um, they overlap among the different types, right? And so that's what makes it so hard to arrive at an official diagnosis sometimes uh, for dementia, is that it's really our best guess. And we have to take into account uh, the behavioral and psychological and cognitive symptoms that the person's displaying and try and, and create um, you know, a, a diagnosis out of that. Um, and so, for instance, with apathy, that can occur in Alzheimer's dementia, vascular dementia, frontal temporal dementia, right? It's very overlapping. Same with depression, uh, with anxiety and irritability. Um, but they are common, right? And so um, 
many people who are watching this, if you are caring for someone with dementia um, or you know someone who has dementia, you might have noticed some of these behavioral and psychological symptoms um, or it might be something that they'll um, maybe have in the future. So hopefully this presentation has helped you kind of better prepare for that. And just to, to conclude, um, you know, these difficult and challenging behaviors, they're displayed by the person um, because of the changing uh, brain, right? So they're not happening because the person is intentionally doing it, but because they're really having brain changes that result uh, in these behavioral and psychological symptoms. Uh, and typically the person has no awareness that this is happening and they can't control it, right? So they're just trying their best. Um, and so planning ahead and learning how to best manage these behaviors will hopefully ease a difficult journey. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about next week with our guest speaker is how we can approach um, and strategies that we can use to address uh, behavioral and psychological symptoms. Um, and so I really encourage you, if you have any questions related to management uh, and strategies, um, to tune in uh, on July 6th, because uh, that's when we'll really get into it. Um, and the takeaway message is just that we cannot change the outcome, right? We can't change that the person has dementia, um, but we can affect the journey, right? Uh, if you're caring for someone with dementia and you have your frontal lobes intact and you can make a decision about how to frame it, how to react to it, um, and how to help them, right, how to support them throughout this challenging uh, journey that they're on, um, that's going to hopefully ease uh, some of it for you. So thanks so much. Um, if you have any um, you know, questions that you would like to speak with a dementia care coach about, I really encourage you, if you don't already have a care coach, uh, to contact us here at the Dementia Society. Uh, we can help strategize, we can help answer your questions um, as best as we can. And so I, I really encourage you to get in touch, uh, to email us as well, or to visit us at dementiahealth.ca. All right, Jessica. So thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. So uh, let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Uh, for maybe you can type it in on the Q and the Q and A box or the chat box. Is there any question out there? Oh, there are a few questions, yes. Okay, we have one question. Um, how did you become a skilled care coach? What is your background, if that is not too personal? Sure, um, so I've had some, some personal experiences in my life uh, with dementia. So I've, I've known a couple of people who are close to me um, who have had it. Um, so that's what got me uh, most interested in the topic. Uh, my background is in psychology. Uh, so I did a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology at the University of Ottawa. Um, and then I did a master's degree uh, in psychology at Carleton University uh, in cognition. Right, so looking at kind of how we think uh, and how our memory and attention works uh, in a healthy brain. Um, and so I became very interested in, in, you know, what happens with something like dementia uh, to those parts of us, right? So how we think and how we feel and act um, because of, of this diagnosis. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, can anyone get a dementia care coach or do you need a referral from a physician? No, no referral needed. None at all. Just uh, you can call us up anytime. Um, normally the first interaction that we have with you uh, might be about 40 minutes or so just to get some background and tell you about what we do here. Uh, make sure we've answered all your questions. Um, and then after that you can call us anytime uh, from 8.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, Monday to Friday. Uh, yeah, sorry, Monday to Thursday. Uh, and then on Friday, we have the reduced hours. We work from 8.30 until 4 o'clock. Okay, we have another question as well. It's a little long. Um, 
So hi, I am currently working with a client, young, approximately 50 years old, with vascular dementia, cardio arrest system related. He is currently living in a long-term care facility. There is a problem with the client getting engaged with therapy, declines physio, does little work with the occupational therapist, has very poor personal hygiene and declines taking a shower, etc. I will join the talk on July 6th, but would psychology input help in getting through to that person? Um, so psychology input, um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. If you mean therapy, um, most likely I, I would say no, because again, that concept of anosognosia. Um, so it's very, very likely um, that the person might actually not realize uh, that they're not um, engaging in hygiene or, you know, they might not care, right? So they might, it sounds like they're feeling apathy. Um, so psychological intervention uh, might not work in terms of therapy because it involves the person learning new skills. Uh, with dementia, it becomes harder to learn new skills, right? Um, so I, I would say, uh, if, if that's what you mean, I don't know if, if you would like to clarify um, what you mean by that, but um, yeah, and then next week we'll definitely talk about uh, management strategies, but you know, really trying to, um, um, I guess, frame it as, you know, what's their underlying psychological experience and emotions in that moment? Uh, and if it's apathy, uh, there, there are ways to frame the situation so that the person will be more likely to engage. Um, but at the end of the day, it's hard to, to make someone do what they don't want to do, right? It's, uh, I'm sure everyone has come across that, that it's, it's very, very challenging. It's a challenging case for sure. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> All right, so do we have any more questions? Uh, is there any question on Facebook? We are live on Facebook. All right, so I think uh, we don't have more questions, Jessica. So if you want to watch this presentation again, you can watch it now. Uh, it's going to be on Facebook and our Facebook page available. And you're gonna, it's going to be also on the YouTube channel so you can watch it on demand. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in. So next presentation is next Monday, July 6th, 2020 at 5 p.m. We will continue our series with part five management of the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. For more information on education, programs, support, visit our website at dementiahelp.ca or register to our weekly roundup. Have a nice day, everyone.